Welcome to uh, this panel discussion uh, where we will be discussing the impact of data science on the next gener the development of the next generation of products in life sciences. My name is Caroline Ferris. Um, I, am, I work at Domino Data Lab uh, where I have recently joined after having spent 20 years at GSK um, uh, creating innovative solutions, technical solutions to business problems, solving complex business problems, and um, trying to keep GSK uh, up to date with the latest scientific and technological progress. Uh, with me today, I have a great panel. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to start with you, Andrea, if that's okay. I have, in my mind, I have it in order. So this is Andrea D'Souza uh, from Eli Lilly. This is Nimit Jain from Novartis, and Sanjay Jaiswal from Accenture. Um, Nimit, what, can you tell us a little bit about Novartis and what it is that you do there? Sure. Uh, so hi, everyone. Um, I am Nimit. I lead the data science team um, for Novartis. Um, you know, Novartis is, is a pharmaceutical company. I'm sure you guys are here to listen about pharma. Um, you know, primarily focused on the uh, five therapeutic areas, and it's a Swiss company. Um, and, you know, when the CEO, uh, about a couple of years back, when the CEO took over, um, his mandate was to uh, really bring data and digital uh, and transform the way we reimagine medicine um, and help pe extend people's life. And my role is primarily there to embed AI into some of the core uh, business operations. Um, and help realize that vision of uh, the CEO. Andrea, what is your title and what, what, is, what is it that you do at Eli? Yeah, Lilly? so I'm Andrea D'Souza. I'm from Eli Lilly and Company. We work in four different therapeutic areas and our vision or mission is to unite science and technology to accelerate the LRL portfolio. That's my lens, my perspective, and I tend to focus in oncology immunology, uh, diabetes and complications, and neuroscience and pain. So um, Nimit mentioned that he's from a central organization. I'm also from a central organization, but I sit within the uh, research part of information mm -hmm. and digital solutions. So if he's a hub, I'm a spoke, but I'm also a hub to a whole bunch of embedded data scientists as we democratize data science across our company. Uh, it's great to be here and just fun fact, I think one of the first algorithms I ever personally wrote was years and years ago uh, when I was working at a startup biotech company that had a huge partnership with GSK. Oh. Thank you. Welcome. Sanjay. What about you? What do you do at Accenture? What, what kind of clients do you work with and in what capacity? First of all, great pleasure to be here. Uh, Sanjay Jaiswal, I'm part of Accenture's what's called Applied Intelligence, which is our analytics practice. You know, Accenture is a very large organization, over 600,000 people. Mm -hmm. Within that, we you know, focus on uh, analytics, which is my role, right? I drive the R&D analytics within North America broad, broadly. And we cover you know, data science across pretty much the broad spectrum research, preclinical, clinical, pharmacovigilance, regulatory, going all the way into product launch. I'm also a clinician by practice, so I trained to be an MD as a doctor, but then I got converted over to data science, right? And here I am, right? Been doing this for the past 10 years, so happy to be part of this great panel here. Thank you, and welcome. And so let, let's start our discussion talking about different uh, use cases and applications of data science, opportunities to apply data science. Um, and, and I'm going to open this up to whichever one's, one of you wants to go first. But can you think of a, uh, an application of data science that was supersized, we had supersized impact? Um, and then after that, is there, was there a use case that you can think of where it was sort of like a surprise, not, an unexpected opportunity to apply data science? So one of the you know, biggest, I think, the, the biggest areas that we can have an impact, especially given all the COVID impacts, is accelerating assets to the market, right? How do we bring drugs faster, you said, mm -hmm. limit, right, to the patients? And one of the big things we have seen is you can, with the explosion of data all around us, how do you use data to help with that, right? And one of the big use cases actually is using data, literally as a, as a digital twin, 
to replace patients, especially in the you know, placebo arm, right? Mm -hmm. So imagine about that, right? You have to recruit 100 patients, 50 can be done with data, 50% progress, right? So that to me, and I know pretty much most of the major companies are working on it, so that's one of the huge, I think a huge impact use case that we're seeing across the industry, right? Even FDA is getting more and more open to looking at real world data sets to mm -hmm. help with that replacement of placebo patients, for example. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanna see, you know, wanna hear from Novartis and, yeah. you know, Andrea to see what else are we doing in this space. Sure, I think, you know, one of the probably uh, connected one is we had a big initiative uh, on with drug development operations, right? And we know operations has so huge data. And I think over the years, what we have done, Novartis has done is, um, it has built five modules, right, to monitor the clinical trials when they are running, to really uh, predict the risk ahead of time, so that you know they, there are people who can mitigate those risks and make sure that the trial runs as smoothly. But the other part we have done in it more upstream is also patient recruitment, right? So we have a tool called Footprint Optimizer. So it will help decide some of the very key questions when you are launching a trial: which country, you know, which hospital, which doctor. So there is an intelligence built in, and as a Novartis, we run about 500 trials a year, right? So we have huge data over the years where we have really passed that information out, built a digital platform to bring all of the data in, and then intelligence on top of it to really um, you know, get the supersized impact. But I think what, where we are not seeing, a, where we were not expecting a supersized impact, um, and happened not because our expectation was not there, we knew that it can do something, but the data science ad advancement was not there a couple of years back. So you know, whenever you're launching a product, you have these uh, launches, you have dossiers which needs to be submitted to, the, um, and these dossiers are very manually crafted, written, right? And, but you know, you're do, you have to do it in 100 countries, um, you know, four or five times a year. It's a very laborious effort. Mm -hmm. And with the development of NLG and NLP, which will, our panelists will also talk about, there's a lot of things which we can do now to automate a lot of things which we would not have imagined before because of the advancement in data science. Yeah. So I'll just echo what they're both saying. I think uh, in the last couple of weeks, we've crossed a million patients that we've lost from COVID. And if you think about the amazing speed at which the vaccines were developed or the medicines were developed, one thing that was clear is we were able to recruit patients for those clinical trials in record time. So I think the biggest opportunity for us as an industry, us as a ecosystem, is to figure out how we find those patients with the right demographics, target population, so that we can get our medicines tested to have the kind of impact we're aiming to happen. That's something that I think our whole industry would benefit from. The other thing that we're doing is uh, we're all realizing that we'll start small, we'll crawl, and then be some sort of technology accelerator like natural language generation that we can then use horizontally for other use cases. So while you might be using natural language generation for clinical trial or dossier creation, we're actually looking at uh, automating part of our patent process, mm -hmm. extracting information out of ELN and those types of use cases. Uh, one example of where we've talked more publicly is we take all of our clinical trial data and we've housed it in a platform. We enable search mm -hmm. using natural language processing and then we allow our scientists to craft analysis plans to ask questions around responders versus non-responders, uh, novel biomarkers you might discover, and then in initially target ID and target validation use cases. So de-siloing of the data across the enterprise for derivative value and use mm -hmm. that hopefully will lead to bigger and bigger impact over time. So you, in, in, with what you're saying about the data and making that data more widely available for various different use cases across the enterprise, and something that uh, Sanjay mentioned about, there's, um, you mentioned about uh, uh, simulating the placebo arm, for example, as a as a as an application. Now, there are regulations around patient data about around how you can use patient data. And 
uh, what, how do you think that, what, how does that impact the, does it, that's a challenge for how we can apply data science? Um, Absolutely, and anonymization is a big thing, right? And yeah. patient centricity, and we should have the flexibility to retract records, right? If patients withdraw the consent, right? So all of those problems are there, right? So, so it's a big thing about traceability, right? To have to have the traceability of the data, you know, all the way from getting it from the patient as it proceeds, you know, through the data collection labs. So there's a lot of applications, you know, data science and blockchain it can be used for that, right? And then if you look at the data sets themselves, right? You have clinical data sets which are anonymized. Mm -hmm. But you also have real-world data sets, right? Could be socioeconomic determinants of health, could be your claims information, you know, in any of that sort, right? So a lot of that is available, curated, you know, from a lot of providers, you know, who actually sell the information. The beauty of the data science is how do you bring it all together in a fashion that's anonymized and get insights, right? We are finding in our research that up to 80% of the reason why patients may not stay on trial or drop mm -hmm. off or not adhere to medication is because of socioeconomic factors, right? So mm -hmm. how do you, before you start the protocol design, before you start the clinical trial, account for that, right? Mm -hmm. and I think we are finding this combination between data sets brought together with the right you know, curation and insights is really helping to find that micro segment of population mm -hmm. and the profiles, digital twins, which will help us in recruit to your point, right, Nimit and Andrea? Yeah. yeah, so I think, you know, data is, is a big challenge and in addition to the compliance and regulatory concerns that you articulated, it's also the variety in data, right? We have petabytes and petabytes of genomics data, novel sequencing methods. The cost of sequencing is rapidly coming down. So eventually we're gonna to get to the point that just like we all get a blood test routinely, you're gonna get sequenced. And that has tremendous consequences or implications for those of us inside the walls of organizations because there is such a high need for data engineers, for talent, for platforms, for technology, for tooling, to do everything really, really, really fast. So I, I think that inside, uh, when we started on our journey with data three years ago, we did not expect to be as successful as we've been and now what we're really struggling with is how do we find the right people who have the domain, the technical expertise that can help us get the data on the platform so we can actually have all of those amazing insights. Mm -hmm. yeah. no, I think you know, I have a very different use case, which I think you know, I'm around the patient privacy and anonymization, um, where uh, I think we, had, um, we have sickle cell disease, right? So we have a medicine for sickle cell disease where we had launched an app where you know, the sickle cell patients can interact and you know there'll be a, there'll be a manager who will help them understand what medication needs to take in what frequency and understand their process and i think again as a data scientist you know the idea was hey can we just mine this information and help better engagement of patients and and can we predict the the uh, you know the symptom of these sickle cell disease which cause it happens about i think twice or thrice a year but it's a very painful process for the patients um, so the idea was, can we use this information and give insights to the you know, patients ahead of time? But the challenge was, you know, and on, because the, there was a chat. So, you know, the patients can chat in the app and using that, we can understand what are they going through. Um, but the challenge was, to re if you have to mine that information, we have to anonymize the patient name from the data. And, you know, what we realized from a data science standpoint, those it was not very clean. You know, the methods are still not developed, matured enough to really uh, anonymize the data um, until, you know, you have, um, until you, you have to figure out something very differently because the, the, the algorithms are still not developed to help you overcome this challenge. So I think that was a, you know, the uh, example I had where we had this uh, exposure, but I'm sure there are many more of this sort. So I, I, can, I can think of a lot of challenges with being able to really get the benefit from uh, applying data science to, to creating new, med new medicines and vaccines. Um, anonymization sounds like it's one of the biggest or right, you know, really right up there. Uh, do you, how do you handle anonymization now and you, how do you see it, uh, us progressing forward and handling it in the future? Sure, so, so just, just coming to Nimit's point, right, yeah. about different types of information, right? I talked about RWD, 
there's clinical information, there's preclinical information, it's all over the place, right? It doesn't make any sense to bring everything together in one big data lake, right? Mm -hmm. So you literally have to leave it at the source. And this is where the whole federated learning concept, right? Where you keep the data at the source, through APIs you're able to access, and you run your algorithms or you push the algorithms, the data science algorithms to the point of source. So the anonymization also is a local thing, right? Mm -hmm. So there are many techniques like masking, et cetera. I know we have startups like Triple Blind, which, you know, which we are working with, but you know, where they're able to keep the features of the data, but yet anonymize it, right? So mm -hmm. I think we need more and more of that, right? But then now you're able to pull that information virtually for the insights, for the problems that you're trying to drive solutions for, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think what we're all saying is clearly there's a personal component to what we need to do. There's a process and then there's a technology. So yes, you have different local methods of anonymization, all across the ecosystem of data. And then you almost always have to do a process check with your compliance or your legal department to make sure that whatever derivative experiment that you're planning on doing, you are allowed to do it with that data. And last, you have to do it in a way that makes sure you comply with every single guardrail. It is patient data, it's sensitive data. And then if I just pivot and always ask that question, would I be okay with this process, with this technology for my data, or more importantly, my kids' data? That's kind of how I keep my true north uh, mm -hmm. center. Especially when you were talking about, you know, we would all get our genes mapped, you know, at some point at <laughs> DNA. <laughs> so, um, I see that there might be some other challenges, for example, um, explainability. And, and this is a challenge not only for the regulators, but for uh, the scientists that you support. How, how do you convince them that your model is good? Or what, what do you do? So I've been toying with this, and I'm going to test it out with you guys. I don't know if you're tweeting. I'm a notoriously not good at tweeting. But this is a tough topic, right? So I've been kind of toying with five questions that uh, I'd like to get answered before I say I can trust the model. Mm -hmm. First is, uh, what's the problem space, the question of interest? You gotta get the context down. But then it's, is it precise? Is it accurate? Is it interpretable? I.e., once you've developed a model, does it play within the boundary space? If I'm working on a drug for a particular cancer and all I've used is patients of European descent, clearly the probability of that working for someone of Asian descent is not high, right, if it's a precision therapeutic. So interpretability is part of that. Then is what I call reproducible slash reusable. There's a lot of pre-competitive models that are available out there, but one of the things we've learned is it takes a lot of work to bring them inside the walls of your company and then get them up and running and configurable within your environment. That's where tools like Domino have a huge opportunity to make our lives easier. If you can do all four of those things, then I think you get to that question that you're asking around explainability. And explainability to me is all about the why. Why, why not? When does it succeed? When does it fail? Do I understand when it fails? And the only way we're all going to be able to trust the models is if you can explain it in a way. I see it as the next frontier for what we're doing sure. with machine learning, deep learning, just like the journey we've come on, getting to transformers, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. I think just to you know pick on this point, um, the explainability parts. I think no, in Novartis, I think if you, it's also in public. I think if you read, Novartis has really um, has a pledge where you know whatever applications we develop, it has to follow eight principle of ethical principles, and which you know one of them relates to explainability. And what we have realized, if I look at you know some of the solutions we have developed so far, which has AI embedded, and when you take it to the business. The, the questions they are asking is going beyond the accuracies of the model, right? I think they, they have, because now we are asking them to use that in the business operation. So they will ask why, 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 the five whys. And that's where this explainability becomes very important to embed from the get-go. You know, because typically as a data scientist, you know, whom, whom I'm sure you do a lot of experiments, and explainability typically comes at the end of your, you know, experiment, which is 
incorrect, knowing that now your business expects the explainability, definitely not only the, your model precision should be higher, but explainability should also be there for them to believe the model. And we heard today in the talk also, right, in the morning, you know, uh, cognitive bias, right, how to mitigate some of the noise and cognitive bias. So I think what we have realized is now, first, we make sure we embed these explainable AI principles from the get-go. Second is also, uh, uh, you know, help clear business about confusion about causality versus correlation. Mm -hmm. Because when you take these explainable AI uh, outputs to the business, they are very heuristic space and they are all, you know, co correlations. They are not causations. So you have to also understand what are they really looking for so they don't misinterpret your results. And the last part of this explainability is also simulation because we know, you know, nobody expected COVID would happen in the next uh, last two years. And everybody was predicting the sales of their, you know, brands going top, but it didn't happen, right? Patients were not going to the doctors. So how to, I think that's where the simulation also now becomes a very important element to extend this idea of explainable AI, where business can, themselves can tweak some of the levers and see how the future can look like. So two things you need to bring in early in the game versus late in the game, explainable AI and simulation. Okay. And yeah. it's also about the data, right? Because the data that's used to train the model has to be diverse, right? Not for a particular ethnic group yeah. or focus on a certain type. And, and as we know, right, the data that you use is, has gaps, right? That's why you need to draw upon this multiple data sources to make sure you're able to get that spectrum to get the model trained properly, right? To be able to be then explain some of the results, right? So I think the data part is also pretty important for this aspect, Andrea. Yeah, no, I, I'll, I'll completely agree. And just to pull on some of the threads, right? Once you've actually got your insight or the model result, if you support researchers, then you have to be able to take that insight and confirm or validate it in the lab. So a closer integration with, between what's happening in the computational world and what's happening in the physical world, whether the physical world is a clinical trial or the physical world is you know, a lab experiment, that's what we're actively uh, heading towards. And so we affectionately call that model-driven drug discovery. So something that we actually were discussing before even getting on stage here, we talked about the quality of the data that actually goes in that, that, that teaches the model. Um, and digitization, that challenge. Can we? Can you talk a little bit about that? I think you know. Uh, you know, uh, I can give you some examples around. For example, we have an initiative called GenChem, um, which is you know trying to find out the and the news is also in public. I think where we partnered with Microsoft to see if we can find out a better target molecule, right? Mm -hmm. And today, if you see, it's a very laborious, manual-driven process, which very much is knowledge driven, expertise driven, and you know, what person is thinking at the mood of the day. Uh, and that's the experiments the chemists do to find out um, you know, possible good molecule. Um, and what we realize is that you know, we have a lot of information available of past experiments which are documented, which you know, these chemists can learn from so that you know, they don't need to do multiple experiments. Yeah? You save time, you optimize cost, and obviously, hopefully, you are able to accelerate, um, you know, the drug discovery time as well. And that's where we realized that, you know, a lot of this information needs to be first digitized, right? Where we have information of thousands of experiments from our prior, um, you know, experiments which these chemists have done. They are all in PDF documents. They are all, you know, handwritten and different forms and shapes. So even if we do data science, you know, to extract, we need some intelligence to parse that information to be easily accessible and available. But I think thanks to now, you know, obviously the advancement some of you guys have made in the space of data science, which will help us accelerate um, this journey. So I think the digitization of data is very, very important. Um, and therefore, you know, some of the other problems on data is also the training data you mentioned, right? So whenever the data scientists start doing any building, any model, for a lot of the cases, your data is not available for training, right? So how do you intelligently use some of the new methods like synthetic data to create a new information to teach the model and then the model improves over time and so on and so forth. So there are two elements, digitization plus also creation of data for training the model, which is enough. Uh, no, I think the number one thing you have to do is get your data investment correct because it will pay off and how it pays off 
is it'll enable you to go faster to getting the analytics to insight uh, question. I simplify it all as data is messy, and in our area, there's so much variability, right? And as opposed to trying to figure out all sorts of complicated ways, for every different type of domain type, uh, we try to figure out what's the marathon we're going to run, and marathons are a slower game, so we can get to a point where we can deliver value back to the business with them. So that's been a huge part of our success story, is really, really focusing on getting the data wrangled, getting it prepped, getting it onto the platform so that you can reuse it for lots of different reasons. We've then developed an app ecosystem on top where you've got, some people just want to compute in the domino environment on the data. Some people actually prefer an app and there's 400 users for that app, so we've persisted it. Some people actually prefer a quick little analysis and an interface that's only gonna last for the duration of three to six months. So we personalize our delivery of the value back based on how long we think it's going to last within the walls of our ecosystem. How do you prioritize what to actually focus on? How, what to focus your data science efforts on? Because there's, you know, there's different things that you can do. Is it based on the, how do you assess the business value? And, I don't know that we have a great answer for this. Do you have a great answer for I this? I think, you know, uh, as I was saying, you know, when the, the new CEO took over, I think, you know, his focus was a lot on data and digital. I think there were three big strategic pillars identified uh, across all the different initiatives which he started as a company, right? So one was innovation, which is primarily around research and development. And the second was speed to market, which is, you know, how, how uh, best we can reach 10x patients 10x times faster. Mm -hmm. And third was operational efficiency. And so a lot of our, you know, prioritization happens across this, um, you know, three pillars. Uh, you know, wherever we make sure that these, some of these initiatives we have has to fit to these three big themes. And then I think this prioritization of those initiatives are definitely is based on multiple criteria, right? So we have these impact assessments which we have to make, you know, before we even jump in execution. Let's go back and think, are we first solving the right problem? Right? Which, again, going to the basics, right? And then there are certain templatized process we have built to identify the right business problem, right? Where we have identified the metrics. The metrics can mean very different to different person, even for the same use case, depending on the persona, your metrics will be very different, right? So identify those personas, those metrics, identify how much change is needed to embed this AI into their business process. Because sometimes you have realized we have a very high accurate model. We have a very sophisticated solution, but the business is not ready to change, to adopt. Mm -hmm. So again, we have the capacity of the data scientists is still fixed. So if we, if we don't rightly prioritize at the get-go, we're wasting everybody's time. So I think that's the first prioritization we do at the, dem uh, at the demand side, right? Across these three pillars and on these three principles. Then we also do the prioritization on the demand side, right? So we make sure that because I'm part of the central team, we make sure that we bring the cross synergies across the function. So we are not reinventing the wheel every time. Mm -hmm. If we have a problem of forecasting in finance and also forecasting in manufacturing, we are not building two different models by two different people, but we are trying to synergize. So there is all of this harmonization happens at the supply side as well as the demand side. Yep. So we definitely do that. And then the other lesson I've learned for all of the reasons you articulated and the change as part of it is because I support research, I have to be more dynamic and be incredibly flexible. So sometimes there is a set of data scientists that are focused on exploration work because you don't actually know the answer to the question, are you going to get an insight or is the project going to end up not revealing anything? So I'll share an example. We were given a really, really tough uh, project. It was detecting the RET fusion uh, protein it was for lung cancer, less than 2% who have lung cancer have that um, alteration. And we partnered with a company, a very small, lean, hungry company called BioAI, and we fully expected to fail. And the reality was we actually were able to detect 
the RET alteration from a very small set of pathology images. But where we are now is we're trying to figure out how we take that work and look to a consortia model to actually do a lung cancer detector because the biggest challenge that physicians face is uh, a lot of the times we run out a sample to actually do the sequencing that we need to do because we serially sequence the tumors. And you know, when we talk about that use case with the payers and the physicians, they get really excited, but it's a long play. Mm -hmm. There's tons and tons of more work that needs to be done in order to get to that value inflection point. From a model perspective, amazing work. From a small sample size, amazing work. From a best use of the tissue in the sample, amazing work. But so much, so much more work to be done to get it to clinical value and impact. And another big facilitator in this whole process is an agile lab, right? Mm -hmm. So after you have prioritized your use cases, you know what to go after, a place where you have like literally a pod structure, right? You have a domain person, you have a technology like Domino available to spin up quickly environment. You have, you know, people with data knowledge, right? Any, any other SMEs, right? In a very quick four to six period, a place where you can run and run through some of these experiments, right? You either you fail or you, or you, or you move forward, right? Mm -hmm. So, that rapid experimentation is a place, you know, given, given the significant investments and the time to acceleration, speed to value, right? I think you need that, and I'm seeing a lot, most of companies now doing these, I know Novartis is doing, you know, so is, you know, Eli Lee, right? A place where you can really come safely, test it out, and prove it out. If you fail, that's fine, you go back again, right? Mm -hmm. And this is all enabled by, you know, having very quick access to data, ability to very quickly spin up an environment, and a much more shortened SDLC life cycle, right? As you guys know, right? Mm -hmm. A validated environment spin up takes time, right? Mm -hmm. So you need a lot of those prerequisites with the right pod structure and all the you know uh, prioritization parameters built in and the right domains to drive the path forward. Thank you. And you mentioned that. Oh, okay. Oh, we, we want to uh, probably leave some time for questions. Um, I actually had one more. If there's a, if one more, one more, and then I will I will open the floor, because <laughs> you mentioned something about collaboration. I think this is very important, and I yeah. wanted to cover that before you, you know, before we open it up. Oh. Just elaborate on that just a little bit. About yeah, I, I mean, I think you mentioned collaborations mm -hmm. with Microsoft. We do have uh, lots of pre-competitive consortia that we're part of. Uh, and then we also do uh, strategic partnerships as it uh, makes sense for Lilly. And the reason is you have to learn from inside the walls of the company and then you have to learn from the external world. We're also finding that we're learning from technology partners. AlphaFold is uh, a, a huge, huge model that uh, a Google uh, spin-off developed this year which actually helps you look at uh, proteins inside the body. And so we have a whole vertical, if you will, of use cases around enabling our scientists to use AlphaFold in a way that makes sense uh, for our business. It comes under our structural biology uh, pillar, if that makes sense. So I think collaboration is key, outside in thinking is key, and hacking together in a very agile environment is key. Um, I'm a sponsor for a hackathon that's coming up. It's <laughs> going to get launched next week. It's uh, NIH uh, Hub Map initiative. And Google and Roche are actually sponsoring the prize money. And we're repeating what we did last year. And we got amazing results, but it's with a different set of data. And we had people from all over the world actually participating. And that is key to elevating all boats, if that makes sense. And I, th I think just to add one point, I think the internal collaboration is also, you know, inside the wall collaboration is also very important. I think to just to augment, because as we heard, you know, the, typically the data science is not a central function, right? or even a dispersed function. It is hybrid model in all of these big organizations. And I think what we do in Novartis is we have something called a community of practice, right? So where we have community of practice on NLP, imaging, causality, and all of these community of practice data scientists come from different functions. 
and they really take this practice to the next, sta next stage where you publish papers, you read papers, you, you share learnings, you, you build these reusable assets, and so on and so forth. So I think those things are happening at, you know, at these large organizations. And the second thing we also do is run a conference, internal conference, right? So where you learn from each other, where it's a proper conference where people present, you have business coming in, and it's a cross-learning business, see the challenges of data scientists, data scientists see the challenges of business, and so on and so forth. So that internal collaboration is also very important for you know, the big enterprises to get the ROI on these big investments. And, and lastly, the open data sets, right? We need data sets for training the models. So how do you make, given all the anonymization requirements, data available, right? I know we have cancel rate, biocell rate, which share toxicity data and some other data, but I think this is a big area for us as an industry, right? To be able to share data sets out there for people to experiment like AlphaFold, right? L really try some of these experimentation which will speed up a lot of this development process, right? Yeah. Yep. So I think we're getting to a few minutes left. Is there, are there any questions from the audience? Um, do we have a microphone back there at all to, for questions? I don't know. Okay. No? Okay. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about collaboration between data scientists and lab scientists? Because just like, you know, we can use these model results to inform your experiments, experimental results can also inform what data you collect and like, what the job data scientists are able to do. Yeah, so let me repeat the question. Can you talk a little bit more about collaboration between the data scientists and the wet lab uh, scientists? So I'll build upon what you said with the communities of practice and then share a rather specific example. So we had an unmet need for next generation data scientists. So we reinitiated our postdoc program at Lilly and uh, we hired postdocs in the labs and then we also hired computational postdocs. And we started to partner them together in their journeys. So high content screening is where we're looking for new drugs and we'll do these image screens and then we'll start to isolate out what are the patterns so we can figure out what targets or areas of biology we want to prosecute for next generation targets. So the computational scientists will do that work and then gave it back to the wet lab scientists to actually execute the work and confirm what we were saying. So that would be one specific example. We've got lots of other examples of that loop that we're starting to close, surely but slowly. It's not easy because the quantity of computational staff we have has been small, but now what's happening all over the company, we're actually hiring data scientists with intent to focus on things that matter to that specific area within our company. Question. You all touched upon the synthetic data in terms of the presentation. I'm curious, as we evolve into more of an AI and all these uh, research environment, do you see synthetic data both growing and increasing? And if so, what kind of problems are the models going to have in terms of validation and then compliance? So I think uh, from my perspective, we should all be clear, some version of synthetic data pharma has been using for years, especially in clinical trials. Simulation we've been using for years, right? When you're talking about synthetic data that's now being generated using some of the newer methodologies like the generative networks, the deep learning models, the transformers, whatever we're gonna do, we, and forgive me, they'll tell you that we talked about this before, we generally think that until you can explain right and all of those why questions and validate the probability of it getting used at a large scale is going to be rather difficult the place i think we'll learn from is actually from the car industry self-driving cars because mm -hmm. there's a healthy amount of synthetic data being used there and whether we do or don't get to level five right if you can trust that self-driving unit to actually help you drive, it stands to reason that slowly over time, more and more industries will use synthetic data for more complex use cases. There's also a factor of anonymization because the source of the 
synthetic data generation itself is patient level information and that by nature itself requires mm -hmm. consent, right? So there's also a factor to your question, that anonymization factor that has to be accounted for as we progress this concept forward, right? No, no, I think, so we have an example where we were working on the research side, right? So we had a clinical trial data, we had to share this with an external organization so they can work um, you know, on the data and AI fi it. But I think that's where we, um, I think we had a hurdle of the methods because I think we talk about a lot of the advanced methods in AI, but you know the, the bar which we have to cross to make it acceptable is very, very high. So that is still not there. So I think in terms of the maturity, we are just starting. What data science was five years back is where we are with respect to synthetic data and approval from uh, regulatory bodies on using that. Mm -hmm. So it's still infancy. I think there's a lot of room to be done from data science side, plus also from uh, educating the regulatory what is possible and what is not possible. And, and the keyword is regulatory grade, right? Which is not a bar mm -hmm. for other industries. So it has to meet that high standard, right? In order to be acceptable for submission, you know, approvals, et cetera, so yeah. Yeah, I think the regulators also need more expertise, right? Because they will only be comfortable with what we are aiming to do when, yes, you have the policy change, but then you have the dialogue and the discussion, and then they've got their own in internal experts that they trust to assess what we're doing, why we're doing, and how we're doing it. I wonder if uh, organizations like Transcelerate might be able to help move that, you know, broker that forward in a way. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, there's also, you know, there's, there's a competitiveness angle, but then there's also patient privacy, mm. and then how much can you share out there, right? So I think you're right. That's why they started with toxicity. I know COVID was one of the things that also was used during the whole last two years. I think there's a lot of scope here, but there's also the barriers are pretty high, as you said, right, Nimit? Mm. Yeah. I think COVID is a great example in the sense that um, it's a positive example of data being shared and having great impact for the benefit of society. So hopefully it won't take another crisis. <laughs> to move us forward like that. <laughs> to move us forward, yeah. Mm -hmm.